What's going on you guys? Right, Jirazi here. Thank you so much for joining me. This is my very special guest, Carl Schmidt, who you should all know if you don't, from, well, what were you going to say? Nothing. Keep introducing me. I want to hear the adulation, the ad admiration. Yeah, so Carl is a very good friend of mine. Have a sip. We go way back. Way back. Having a little kiki here. We are having a kiki. And Carl is the genius mind behind Plus Life Media. Do you know what, thank you. Do you know what I would like you to do? I'd like you to take this footage and then I want you to find the last video we did together, sitting on a sofa. I'm gonna and do a side by side comparison. No, I think I was sitting I really on that. I don't want to do that. Why? Because Why? Why don't you? They'll look be it? like, was this one shot with a wide angle and the other one wasn't? Well, that's something we can talk about over the next few <laughs> minutes. But it's interesting because we haven't done this and since we sat in my stu then studio apartment yeah. on a sofa that I ended up, you ended up having. Yeah. And now here we are right. on a much more luxurious sofa in a much more luxurious apartment that is yours um, and on Bose. the 25th floor and Bose um, and, and celebrating all the success you've had. Look at this place, it's beautiful. It really is, I love it. It's my little heaven. It, how important is it to have a little heaven like this? For me, yeah. being an introvert, it's critical. Is it hard to leave? Yeah. Mm. I will spend days here not having left. Sounds like heaven. <laughs> All right, what do you want to talk to me okay. about? I'm here. I've got, well, I'm trying to sit up straight to hide my belt. Last time we chatted, we talked a lot about that old commercial. Oh, yes. That's right. The, the Grim Reaper. Mm -hmm. And I will put, a, put up a card. Mm. So if you want to watch that video from years ago. From 1987. <laughs> no. Yes. Oh, that the video. The commercial, not us. Not us. Okay. Um, then, yeah, watch that. Otherwise, that's all we really, well, we got into some things. But we didn't ever talk about you or your life or your story that's because it's not that exciting is it not? no it's fine um my life my story well i grew up in australia until i was 10 and then from the age of 10 i moved all over the world i lived in fiji and new zealand and england and and here and i'm grateful for that because you know when you're when you're a kid in a teenage year a bit like you're making me move again and you don't like it but what it did was it forced me to um you know, make new friends and also be very open-minded about things. Um, you know, different cultures mm. and experiences. Yeah. And when I lived in Fiji, I went to an international school. And so all my classmates were, you know, from every part of the world. They were Dutch, they were Fijian, they were Samoan, they were from America, they were Indian. They, like, so, you know, there was never just a, a sort of a one size fits all kind of thing. Yeah. And how I now look back on that and fast forward to today and being someone living with HIV and living here in the United States, um, it just makes you appreciate and realize and celebrate what makes everyone different and unique. Um, kind of, you know, brings us all together as well. Um, and, and so... Which I, these days is hard to find. Which these days honest. is really hard to find. Unless you're on the DL, which, as you know, you can't say that anymore. Um, no, that was an inside joke. But anyway... Um, so I grew up all over the place, but interestingly, here in Los Angeles, this is the longest I've ever lived anywhere in my entire life, and it's coming up 15 years. Do you love it? Um, I don't know whether love it is the right term. It's, I will say this, it is home. And, okay. and my judgment for that is often like when I travel. Like I know when I used to live in England, right, and I love London, but I would be landing into London after having been away, and I'd look out the plane window, and I would just sort of get Oof, in my stomach. Mm -hmm. um, when I land, when the plane circles over down, right over your apartment and loops back to LAX, <laughs> and I look out the window now here, I go, I'm home. And that's a really nice feeling, a sense of, of yeah. belonging in that sense. Um, the people are interesting, but. Do you see yourself settling down here? For now, yeah. Look, it depends. As my parents get older, you know, my parents are in Australia. And, uh, but I have a brother who lives here in the States. So this family here, yeah, for now. I mean, I'm a US citizen these days, as are you. Mm -hmm. I don't think either of us were US citizens when we last lived. We were not. That's funny. Mm hmm. Yep. Um, I became a citizen when Trump was. Yeah, I did too, but I didn't want, I didn't do, I actually held off doing. Did you do the ceremony? Yeah. I held off, well, no, I qualified 
this, if this is a thrilling conversation for you all to listen to, but you have to have a green card for like five years, right? And then after five years, you can become a US citizen. So my five years came up during Trump, but I waited until he was gone mm -hmm. and then said, I will go and be sworn in. I didn't want to be sworn in, in as a US citizen under Trump. But that's not what we're here to talk about. No, so you came to the U.S. Mm -hmm. And is this where you were diagnosed? No, I was diagnosed in England. Okay. And actually, I, which meant that coming into the U.S. was a little tricky at the mm. time because there were still rules and regulations about communicable diseases. Um, that being said, I came in and I started treatment here. So when I was diagnosed in England, um, 15 years ago or thereabouts uh, it was very different to how they do things here in the states it's the same now but back then if you were diagnosed with hiv and your cd4 count was high and you were healthy and robust and all of right. that um then they didn't put you on meds straight away it was kind of like look your body's doing what it's meant to do it's doing a great job we don't need to introduce this until we'll wait until hiv damages until, your body well, yeah, until it, well, and yes, I mean, I don't, those were not the exact words, but yes, until it gets to a point where it can start to really have a, a risk. Yeah, and I, and I think that the reason reasoning behind that is that the medication itself was toxic. toxic. Uh, yeah, and it's certainly, we've come so a long way in the last 15 years. Yeah. yeah, it was. So, but when I got here, I remember going, and I have no problem calling them out for it because it was disgusting behavior. I was at the LA Gay and Lesbian Center on, on, in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and they assigned me a doctor, um, and this horrible little man, um, I was sitting in one of their sort of rooms in a hallway, you know, like with curtains, so it's like little consultancy rooms down a hallway. Yeah. So your other patients, you can hear kind I of what's going on. Yeah. And this little man came in and, and read me the riot act for not being on medicine. And I said, well, hang on, you have to understand, I get my primary treatment is in the UK. And at this point, I was commuting back and forth to England four times a year. Okay. So whenever I went back to England, I saw my primary care physicians and did everything there. Good. Yeah. And this man yelled at me. I mean, yelled at me. Can you explain what the Riot Act is? The, oh, read me the Riot Act. Sorry, the Riot Act is like if someone yells at you, gives you a lecture. Oh, it's a, it's a saying. It's, a, it's an expression. Well, you yeah. have, like, there wasn't some the No, 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 no. Sorry. So he yelled at me and said, he basically, the, the language he used was, well, you're going to die of AIDS if you keep doing this. You know, you obviously don't care that you're, you're just going to let yourself die of AIDS. And I remember leaving yes. and sitting in my car and bursting into tears. Mm. Because up until that point, I had lived for however many years um, without the meds. I mean, I knew I was HIV positive. Um, this is pre U equals U being the go to, by the way, undetectable equals I'm assuming pre crap as well. Yeah, pre all of that. So, um, so I sort of lived like HIV was there, but it wasn't there because I didn't really have to do anything about it. Anyway, it wasn't until fast forward a few years, literally a few years later, um, and they discovered Carposi sarcoma on me oh, in a not so I attractive place. Yeah. Hmm. Um, well, it was not in a, let's just say it was internal and not somewhere you typically go looking mm -hmm. um it's amazing they found it well yeah they would check me out for something else mm. and that's when it got real and then mm, that's what I'm saying. and that's when i got on the meds but the the sort of the irresponsibility of all of this is that then clearly for a period of time i was more than just detectable um you know and and i i was having sex with people um, and sometimes they, you know, I would disclose my status and sometimes they wouldn't be a condom. So I was, there were certainly risk factors. Mm -hmm. Um, and in, anyway, needless to say, I got on meds, became undetectable very quickly, yeah. uh, and have been ever since. And now I'm happy to say that in the UK and most countries, um, we now, the, the practice is uniform. You're diagnosed, get on treatment, get undetectable. That being said, I just got back from Japan not long ago. And we're trying to do some work in Japan at the moment because U equals U, undetectable equals untransmittable, only really works as a thing if people can get access and become undetectable. Yeah. It's all good and well saying undetectable equals undetectable, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. and it is. I mean, it's a game changer. But 
it only works if we can get everyone undetectable. Mm -hmm. And Japan still has this rule where you can't even get access to the HIV medicine until your body becomes so compromised. Oh, wow. So the medicine treatment in Japan is free, um, but you don't get access to that medicine until you're in quite a bad situation and then it's fine well, so that so that like the whole point of u equals u you, you might as well throw out the window in japan so we're trying to change that well, um and other countries around the world where that is still the thing mm -hmm. that's our that's kind of our new calling i guess we're saying u equals u is a win-win right if i'm undetectable then there's no risk to you but beyond that I'm putting less of a burden on the healthcare system. If you think about all of it, it really is a win-win. I'm healthy, you're healthy, therefore you're not having to take care of me in the system, so they win, um, and we're really pivoting away from the original U equals U and saying, we have to get everybody access to this medicine. There's no excuse and right. no reason why people shouldn't get it. And the epidemic can be stopped. We can stop it, but the whole thing can be stopped right now. Yeah. It's interesting when we talk about that, and I saw that the president and you know other people have been making these great statements about you. You know, we all want to end HIV by 30, 2030, right? So that's seven years away. It's coming up. It's coming up. So if we know what we have to do, why do we still have criminalization laws? Like if everyone goes, we want this to end, and if we know that if you if you decriminalize HIV, there's one whole chunk that we've taken care of. And if you get everyone the medicine, there's the other thing. Like, I don't understand why this stuff gets held up and, and we all say we want to ch stop it, yet we're still putting people like you and I in prison yeah. for no reason, even if there's no intent and we know that we can't transmit the virus, you and I can still be locked up in 30 states in this country. We can be sent to jail simply for not telling the other, res I mean, the other consenting adult okay. that we have HIV. It doesn't even matter if there was malicious intent or not. No and, it doesn't, and it doesn't even have to be proven. I don't even have to prove it. Their word against, their word against yours. Mm -hmm. So you could be an angry, bitter ex about something and go, okay. fuck you, yeah. I, I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to go and do this and that's it. And you have to register as a sex offender. <laughs> well, not only is it just the criminalization that already exists? Mm -hmm. But now we're in a, in a state where we're starting to roll back, mm -hmm. which is very scary. Well, I think that's got a lot to do with these politicians. You know, for so long, it's been a perfect box, right? And in the last 10, 15 years, we have Gen Z and, and millennials pushing through, saying, actually, I'm not a him, and I'm not a her, I'm a this. And as LGBTQIA plus people now become more acceptable, this box that society has so comfortably and safely lived in yeah. is starting to warp, right? And the walls are starting to go. And these people who are mostly cisgendered white men of a certain age don't want anything that's going to challenge the norm. I think the reality is in 15, 20 years, that box will not exist anymore. We'll have broken through it. And they have to realize that this new generation of people, um, thank God, feel safe and comfortable enough mm -hmm. to be who they truly are. And part of it is birthing pains in my pers perspective because we, we start to explore what gender fluidity is, mm -hmm. intersexuality, of sex and all of it, and we push out, push out, push out, push out, and then we get these extremes. And the extremes on the margin, that's what's publicized, that's what's in the media, that's what commentators talk about. It doesn't necessarily represent the majority of us, and it might not be something that even really matters all that much in 10 years from now, but it's as we're growing and learning and discovering, figuring out what's what, pushing the walls out, it, it goes to the extreme, and then it eventually contracts a bit, and it's like this pendulum swing from conservative to progressive. Right. How important do you think it is, and let's just use the HIV space, okay. to have people who are living with HIV being part of the policy making and changing, that people who are having lived experiences 
are the ones at the highest level who go actually well, this is right or that's right versus what we typically have now which as i said is mostly cisgendered white straight men in their late 60s 70s early 80s who get to make the decisions for everybody yeah i mean anything that has to do with any portion of the population should have representatives from that because they're going to know they have the lived experience mm -hmm. and they're going to know things and understand things that even if you're trying to think logically about things, you're not going to know from right. anecdotal situations. Like, I get mad. I, I would get annoyed. I shouldn't say mad. I'd get ir irritated. It's probably better. When... You can be mad. <laughs> when a certain, you know, national broadcaster that I sometimes associate with um, would do all these great things around a Talk LA or World AIDS Day, and they produce this stuff. And I, I, I should say... This was the case. It's not the case anymore because I said something. But they would produce all this stuff, and I, I'd see it on the air, and I'd say, "Who wrote that? It's not you. You can't." We, and they'd go, "Oh, well, we just got it." And I said, "Well, did anyone think to come and talk to the one person in the building who's mm -hmm. living with HIV?" Yeah. I would have happily shared some experience with you, yeah. and I, that was the beginning. I'm ha very happy to say now that it's not the case there, and that. Whenever stuff like that, we put stuff out like that, mm -hmm. you know, and we have great connections with other HIV organizations around Los Angeles, things get very carefully looked at. But, yeah. but uh, you know, the fact that I said, you've got someone living in your yeah. building with you all yeah. and you're ignoring it. So I think it's really important that people like us have a voice at those higher levels. It, to me, it's obvious. But a lot of common sense stuff is obvious. Yeah. To, and a lot of the people in this country mm -hmm. don't say no. that. Okay. No. So, okay, yes. taking it back a little bit, Okay. Um, at what point did you go from living your life, now you're on meds, mm -hmm. you're undetectable, to, hey, I want to talk about... It was, it was an accident. Um, it wasn't really... I don't... I, I, I was... I wasn't in the closet about my HIV status. People knew about it. Um, I mean, you knew about it. But I wasn't public in my professional persona. Yeah. So... That was, was that scary, the idea of sharing that? Well, because it wasn't a calculated share, it was almost an accidental share, mm. um, I didn't have much thought in it. I, I'd hesitated doing it. I had purposely sort of, okay. you know, I was not in the closet about my HIV status as far as friends and family and, and partners, mm -hmm. but professionally I was because I worked in television and a lot of very well-meaning people had said to me, you don't want to become known as the guy with AIDS on television. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I sort of listened to that and I thought, yeah. And I also thought, well, my HIV diagnosis and me living with HIV doesn't affect how I do my job. Like, it is, so really, why talk about it? I mean, there's no real reason to talk about it. Um, but I hoped that one day, maybe somehow, then I, I'll find more of a reason and mm -hmm. I can talk about it and not worry about consequences. And then one day after a couple of cocktails, I wrote something on social media and went to bed and didn't think about it. And the next day it had completely changed because it went viral and went everywhere. Um, so there wasn't a calculated thought about it. And once it had happened, it was like, well, I can't put that back in the box. Mm -hmm. So I got to roll with it. So did you have a moment where you're like, I don't know how this is going to affect my I career? Had, no, I had a moment of fear that that my primary employer at the time would think that I had done this as some kind of publicity mm -hmm. get. So my concern was that they would think, oh, he's gone kind of rogue. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I just hadn't thought about it. So it wasn't the case. And thankfully, they were all very supportive. So it wasn't so much of a problem. And, you know, I got asked the other day, do I think it's affected my career? And the answer is, I don't know, right? And certainly to my face, with the exception of one person, everyone's been very supportive. But I don't know what people say behind conference room doors or in, on private emails. So maybe people do go, oh, well, he's a little too vocal in that space. It's Perhaps he's not different vocal. than it used to be if you were to come out either as gay or HIV positive, being pigeonholed. I've heard that before too, as far as like being an influencer and doing content. Right. Like you don't want to be known as the HIV guy. You're right. so much more than that. You're so much bigger than that. That all may be true, but why, why should that hold me back from going 
Well, well and why not? And why not? Exactly. And why not? And I will tell you this. I mean, there are several public figures now in this country who are openly HIV positive. And, you know, I don't have a problem. Billy Porter yeah. publicly said it and told me. He, I knew before he came out. He said, because of you, I can do this. And he said it since. And there have been other people. I think if you look at Jonathan Van Ness and other people in queer culture who have now felt comfortable to say it. I think someone always has to start. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't intentionally start, but I think you're able to go, well, it didn't go so bad for him, so maybe it'll be okay for me. I know of at least two other very well-known, high-profile celebrity people who are desperate to talk about it, mm. but just yeah. still don't quite have the right voice for it yet. Yeah. And it was the best thing ever, because to your point, yeah, I don't mind being known as the guy, quote-unquote, with AIDS. I don't have AIDS, by the way. Um, did you ever? No. You okay. did. I know your situation. So well, I guess I'm always AIDS diagnosed. Well, no. See, now I had this conversation th with a doctor mm -hmm. on a podcast just this week. Okay. Because I had a guest on Plus Life who got really mad at me. We were doing an episode about being older and living with HIV. Mm -hmm. And he come after me on Twitter, actually, and that's why I booked him on the show to talk about it. Okay. Because he's like, you him. keep talking about HIV and HIV, but what about those of us with AIDS? And my understanding was, you know, you sort of, AIDS is a symptom of HIV, right? Once, once if you're, if the HIV has had such a, a good time wrecking your body, mm -hmm. the next stage is acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. It's right. a, it's a stage of HIV. And that is that, you know, something as simple as a cold or, you know, a very minor thing that most of us would be completely okay with and deal with that can kind of knock you down and take you out. Um, but this man said, I was diagnosed with AIDS, and so I have AIDS. And then I had another long-term HIV survivor. So what was his issue? That you weren't talking about AIDS. the experience of li living with well, AIDS? Well, I wasn't. We were just referring to HIV pe positive people, not people with AIDS. And I'm like, but, but you are still alive. Like, and But I said, but you're not. I said, what you, are, you, are you undetectable? And he said, yes. And I said, you don't have AIDS anymore. And so to this week I asked the same question yeah. to a doctor and I yeah. said, help me understand. And he said, well, it's about language and things have changed. Back then, yes, you got an AIDS diagnosis, so it was on your medical chart, you had AIDS. But the reality is that if you become, through treatment, mm -hmm. undetectable again and everything, you're a person living with HIV. You're not someone who has AIDS. Right. Yeah. But from a medical standpoint, at some point, you you were diagnosed with, I guess, AIDS-related. So I'm always considered AIDS. Are you though? Diagnosed. Yeah, that's what I was told from just from a strictly medical perspective, which I think. Do you is, think that still stands? Ask your doctor if you have. Yeah. Interesting. Mm -hmm. It's not. I don't think that's helpful in the narrative, and I don't think it's reflective of any kind of. Because you don't walk around saying I have AIDS, do you? Nor does it reflect my health. But do you do you say hi? I'm Raif Darazi, and I have AIDS. No, I think that would be misleading to say that. Correct, but you're AIDS diagnosed. I'm. I disagree with saying that you referring to people living with HIV is exclusive of people who are living with AIDS or AIDS diagnosed. How whichever bucket you fit into. Right. It's like saying. You're referring, you're talking about human beings, yeah. and because you didn't mention Europeans, right. then you're leaving them out. It's like, Listen, no, you are falling to the larger yes. category of humans. Well, we're all very sensitive. I know. As I, as I, constant, sensitive as I seem to discover a lot. And I think we just all need to just button up a little bit and not be so trigger sensitive. Yeah, I would agree with you on that one. Because it's not, it's not contributing to the overall... Important no, and, and I think, you know, look, there's a lot of, we, there are, I, sadly, I think there is a lot to be angry about these days. But on the flip side, um, there's also a lot to be grateful for these days and Always. optimistic about these yeah. days, especially when you look at HIV and where we're at. Yeah, look, the, 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 it's true. Rates are climbing in, in parts of this country and around the world. We know about disparity. We know that there just isn't a fair level playing field when it comes to access and treatment and all of that. 
The flip side is, we have, as I said earlier, all these tools and the medicine mm -hmm. to stop all of this. The question is, how do you get everyone on the same page? And that, I think, is the biggest struggle we've had from day one with this. Mm -hmm. Uganda just passed... Uganda just paid us past basically this. reaffirming what they already yeah well uh, and you have to understand a lot of the African nations Ghana a lot of them have these horrible laws mm -hmm. in place what's interesting I think in most of sub-Saharan Africa and I know we're talking specifically about anti LGBT LGBT legislation and I should say this is also the case in places like India right um, HIV infection rates are higher actually amongst heterosexual people than they are yeah. gay people. So yeah. I think, you know, yeah, and so when we look at in, in the Western world and countries like the United States or England or Australia, um, it's predominantly HIV has been seen as a white gay man's thing, right? Yeah. Whereas in Sub-Saharan Africa and places like India and all of those countries, it, that's not been the case. It's mm -hmm. actually been, you know, the and I guess it's largely because of the laws, right? So we don't talk about gay people, right. so they're in the closet, so we don't really know. Mm -hmm. But most of what we see is is straight people. But what this does, this ridiculous law in Uganda that says that you know you can be punished by death for being gay, just further puts everyone back yeah. in the closet and stops talking about things. And when we, do, I was asked to finish the sentence the other day, uh, which was. Uh, the end of the HIV epidemic looks like, and I had to finish it, and it was four of us sitting around the table, and I said, it looks like this, people talking yeah. about yeah. HIV and not being afraid of it. Yeah. My cynical mind just said, a long shot was the sure. answer to that. But we can't, be, but and the reason I say that is not because you're I think it's so <laughs> it depends on what day you ask. Yeah. Me. Um, it it's because it's HIV is so much more than just the virus. It's it's social, it's class, it's politics, it's all of it. Yeah. So in order to solve that, you have to solve this huge comprehensive Well, uh, I say it all the time, HIV won't kill you, but stigma will. Yeah. And it's that's the that's the biggest hurdle right now is the stigma and the misinformation that is still out there. I've said this to you before. I've said this a thousand times, right? Mm -hmm. If you see a can of Coca-Cola, you know what it is. Dive it. Whatever. If you see, you know, we know what a McDonald's French fry is. Mm -hmm. We know what, you know, if you hear the, the, the slogan, just do it, you know it's Nike shoes, mm -hmm. right? You know all this without and without really having much of a grasp of what goes into the French fry or what's in the Coca-Cola. You, you just know it because it, we know. And we need to get HIV to a stage where it doesn't matter if you're black or white or Asian or rich or poor or whatever, Catholic or Muslim, you know what it is. Oh, that's HIV. I know what it is. And you know what it is. We don't have that. And it needs to be literally as simplified as that. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's what that is. I know what it is. I, but, but that's where we have to get with people. And I think it will take a very smart marketing person and agency to come up with a campaign that doesn't just speak to gay white men, doesn't just speak to people of color in the South here, um, but is universally, instantly recognizable that you go, that's what that is. And well, I was going to say, you're, talk you're talking about branding. Yeah, it's exactly. We need to kind of brand it like, you know, any other mass consumer kind of item. Because although it's not something you sort of drink or consume, HIV can, con it can consume you. It's part of our world. Yeah. And I think we have to sort of approach it more like that than just say undetectable equals untransmittable, take your meds. But I think shows like Plus Life are contributing to that narrative. Well, I hope so. I mean, that's why we I mean, that's created the, it. The point, yeah. You're, it's, yes, it's about HIV, but it's about living your best life. As, as the C's, living with HIV. As the author George M. Jones said in his book, you know, it's often very difficult um, to, to like and accept yourself when you don't see other people like you mm. 
being celebrated and thriving. And so that's why we created Plus Life, is to show everybody, no matter where you're from, what color your skin is, who you pray to, what, how you identify, that, you know, this is just a part of me, and look how great every other part of me is. And that's what we do with it. And that's, you know, why you're there as our fitness guru. Um, and, you know, we have a great team of people. Just, just celebrate that, yeah, I've got HIV, but look, look at everything else I can do. Mm -hmm. I think it's really important, and that's, you know, part of why we sit and have these conversations on your lovely leather sofa. Isn't it so cool? With your dog over here, so who's plush. behaving. It is plush. What's going on? Are you, you, you are our health and fitness guru. How are you feeling about your health and fitness? <laughs> well, I have, I mean, as most of you who follow me know I've been struggling with my weight. Since it's hard, right? Pandemic. 2019, I was like 160 pounds coming off of competing i'm now 195 yeah ish i got as high as 210 that was i'm 210 two okay i stood on the scale today and i used to be 180 mm -hmm. it's really fucking hard oh yeah how do you stay positive and keep going because it is a it's a struggle how do you maintain your kind of outlook to keep pushing yourself and do you do you want to get back to that? Do you want to be bodybuilder Raif again? Yeah, because I do. It, yeah, I really do. I'm hungry for that. And I would say what I tell people lately is that I, I'm not Mr. Optimistic, hopeful, you know, spring chicken shot all the uh, time. Who knew? I'm not. Uh, it's true, he's not. My, my close friends know that I'm like a cynical, old sassy, queen. <laughs> old queen, <laughs> fuck you. Um, but the, the goal is that when you're feeling good about yourself you have routine and you have processes in place that are going to support that and prop it up for as long as possible and then when you inevitably when i inevitably have my down down moments and my down days and my down weeks sometimes that i lessen the degree of that fall as much as possible mm. so it's all about kind of t a balancing act yes and supporting the positive and minimizing the negative it's not about preventing either because they're both it's just going to happen that's natural it's, it's going to happen so, so yeah. yeah and the, the only way to do that because you can't just suddenly start to fall into a depression or start to feel bad about yourself or whatever and just be like oh i'm going to do this thing it's going to i'm going to start gratitude journaling and i'm going to and i'm going to you know talk to myself in the mirror and do affirmations and right you don't your brain doesn't help you in those moments no to it think doesn't about constructive positive yeah. things so that means when you are in a in a place where you can think about those things and form habits and 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 routines that's when you have to do it so that when you do have a negative time those things are already in place it's like you're going through your day and you, ha you have your routine that you do and those things are going to help you because you solidified that in the good times i always say i think it's really important to recognize that it's okay not to have a good day yeah. I think it's so important because we, again, in this age of social media that we live in and, you know, everything's curated and we, and, you know, we all do it. We put the best of ourselves out there because mm -hmm. why would you ever put the worst of yourself out there? It's not that pretty. Um, so we live in this sort of fast paced consumer world where everything we see, whether it's on our social media or even television, everyone's happy all yeah. the time. And we're constantly told to strive for happiness that is the goal is to can't you know is to never be negative i'm not a negative person well guess what sometimes shit happens mm -hmm. and it's okay to be negative it's okay to sit there and go fuck this i don't want to do it anymore and throw a tantrum it's okay yeah. it, it's important though what what is the most important part is once you've had your tantrum and thrown your toys out of the or whatever is that you say okay now I've sulked and tantrum how do I get up mm -hmm. and I think it's how you get up that determines much to your point of talking about the fitness thing and just what you were saying how far you fall down in the mud the next time right but I think it's important to allow ourselves to full feel the full range of emotions and I think especially for those of us living with HIV it's really important because we've be constantly being barraged with Life is great, life is beautiful, uh, and it is. It's all of those things, but sometimes it's not, and sometimes it's hard. Mm -hmm. And it's okay 
because I think we, we're setting ourselves up for failure so often now because we go, well, shit, look at everyone else so happy and yeah. so great or so in shape and so buff right. and I'm not. Yeah. And it seems no matter what I do, I can't get there like everyone else. What we don't realize is that everybody else is having exactly the same feelings. Yeah. We are. And that's why I'm sort of glad that I'm kind of going through this phase of my life with my followers and mm. social media. Do you have a name for your followers? Are they like the Durazians? I haven't, I haven't come up with my, maybe my Durazians. Thrivers. Your, it would be my Thrivers. Thrivers. Yeah. That sounds like a muscle. I have a Telegram you. group that I, I put together called Thriving Fam. Mm. That's very um, Tamara and the whole Tam fam. Is it? Yeah, she has the tan fan. Yeah, she does. So, and because we're social creatures by yeah. nature, it's also important not just to feel the way that we feel, but it's also important to communicate it, to declare it. Yes. Because a lot of us feel, yeah, we might say, okay, I'm having a down day, I'm feeling depressed. But I can't talk about it. But I can't talk about it. I'm no. gonna, I accept it, but I'm not going to share it with anybody. Well, and we also have to be better friends with each other because... I think sometimes I look at sort of my circle of friends and, you know... You just hate them. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. Sometimes. But and they hate me. But I think, you know, there's nothing worse, right? At least for me anyway. When you're feeling down and not great and you sort of, you let someone know and you go, I'm just sick of it all today. I find there's nothing worse than someone going, what do you have to be upset about? Look at your life. Look how fabulous it is. Look at you. You look where you live. And you just go, it just makes you feel like shit even more because you go, great. Yeah, I have this great life. What's wrong I, with me? What, yeah, what's wrong with me? Why can't I be happy? Look, and I come to you as my friend to say, I'm having a bad day. Can you just let me bitch and moan? And instead you're saying, what? Why? Look how great your life is. Oh, great. I'm such a fucking loser. I can't even be happy with what I've got. Mm -hmm. It just makes me feel worse. Yeah. I think we have the tendency as friends and loved ones. We're to trying to fix it. Yes, we're trying to pick. But, but let me tell you, that doesn't always work. A depressed person doesn't need to be reminded how, of how good they got it when they are not feeling good about themselves. Yeah. I think it's... I know what we're trying to do, and it's a nice intention, but just don't. And when we're, That's my two cents worth. <laughs> when we're communicating, it's not necessarily that I need an answer from you. No, it's I just that I just need you to listen. I just need you to hear yeah. me and to understand where I'm at. I agree. And, and that alone, that is like healing. Yeah, and you go, you know, I was with a very good friend of mine just yesterday. And, and, you know, everything that kept coming out of their mouth was negative. I'm broken. I can't. I can't. I can't. And I went, okay. Well, then that's fine. And, and, and it's sort of like, get it off your chest. Yeah. And then I said, instead of saying, you know, I can't, maybe a shift would be, I'm struggling with. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. can't is so definitive. Mm -hmm. But if you're struggling with, well, then how can we get over that struggle. Because I think if you say, I can't, or I'm broken, or I'm this, and I'm guilty of it too. Me too. It's, it's, it's a closed book. Yeah. And it's okay to let all that out. But I think, you know, I think the, the helpful way is to go, okay, but what if instead of can't, it was, you know, if this is really I'm not hard. ready. I'm not ready. I don't like want that. to. I don't want to. I say I don't want <laughs> That's to. That's often the case. That's, I don't want to. Yes. I say yes, and then the minute I say yes, I go, why did I say yes? Yeah. What, what, is your, what is your goal? And you mentioned a little bit about pivoting with U equals U. But overall, like, what, where do you see Plus Life going, growing into? And what, at what point do you say, I've achieved fundamentally what I set out to do? What's next? Well, that's an interesting question for me because I think part of my, um, the work I constantly have to do on myself is that I feel nothing I ever do is good enough. Can really? And so, and that's a double-edged sword, right? Because mm -hmm. it means you're constantly kind of cri overly criticizing yourself, but it also c continually pushes you. Um, so I don't settle. So I think with Plus Life, you know, we set out to create something that was sort of a beacon for people who were newly diagnosed to 
look at and go, wow, it doesn't have to be all bad. But it was also created to educate and inform people who think that HIV has nothing to do with them. Mm -hmm. I, can't, I get asked a lot by people, okay, so who's your demographic for Plus Life? And I say, everybody. Mm -hmm. And the number of people at big corporations who have said, well, no, that, that you have to, you, no, you've got to have a demographic. And so my demographic is everybody. And, and then I go, well, who, who's demographic, HIV, what's the demographic for HIV? And, and they go, well, gay, and, and I'm, yeah, I said, but HIV can affect anybody. It does. And it does. Mm -hmm. And it may not be direct. You know, it might be that, uh, you know, I'm living with HIV, and, you know, but it's had an impact on my aunt, exactly. for example, that I don't know about. So we've created and we continue to evolve and create this space that is a resource um, for people to see what HIV really looks like in this day and age. Um, an opportunity for people to share their stories and their voices mm. um, and their experiences. And, and yeah, and I think by shared experiences, you know, it just gives it an opportunity for people to see the reality and to learn. So I'd like us to just keep doing what we're doing. I'd like us to have a bigger reach. Mm -hmm. um, Plus Life has always been in my mind something that's very mainstream. It's not niche. It's, you know, we, we talk about the science and we talk about all of that, but we do it and communicate it in a way that is um, easy, I hope, to digest. I, look, I put myself as the audience. Now, you're much better than this at me, than me, because I've seen when you go to your doctor's appointments and you, and you talk quite, no, you, you have a real interest, whereas I go in and I'm like, am I undetectable? And is there anything I need to know? Because they start prattling off all this stuff to me and I don't know what it means. And, mm. and, and I'm not saying this is the right thing. It's it probably immature on my part. But I'm like, it's too much. It's too much. Yeah. Um, and, and for most people, it should be that. Yeah. Just quick, simple, to the point, move on with your life. And that's what it is. Um, so that's what I hope that we can continue to keep doing. And just making it as sort of this mainstream thing. Uh, and there are a lot of other great organizations out there that are doing the same work. Um, and so we just want to keep collaborating with folks like that and people like yourself and, and cause I'm of the belief that we're in this together, right? And collaboration is key. I had someone come up to me once in New York from a publication mm -hmm. and they shook my hand and they said, it's so nice to meet you. I know where, I know where the competition. And I looked and I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, you know, I know. And I said, please, I said, oh my God, is that how you see us? Please don't see us as the competition. Yeah, that went right where I, where I wanted to go. I, it's it's not. We're, this is a collaborative effort. If you're doing good, I'm doing good, and we're doing good work together. It's not zero sum. Correct. You don't have to lose in order for me to win. But there are a lot of activists out there now, Rave, whose egos have become ridiculous. Yeah. And they're making it about themselves. And I take an issue with that. It reminds me of Eckhart Tolle when he talks about the pain body. Well, look at you being all all smart with pulling out quotes. You know Eckhart. Do I? Am I yeah, he's the, he's the little, is he bald? I don't know. He's the little bald he's guy. He's the little white man. He's, he's the speaks, little bald white man. He's very like, okay. quietly. You can edit this bit out. I don't think if <laughs> Eckhart sees this, he wants to be known. I'm not going to edit this out. Yeah. Eckhart, Eckhart, you know that you're You're ego. the little short bald man. He's all about ego and he, how he has released his ego. So he will It's so care. important because, I mean, I know of a couple of people. You and I had some experience. But we were in but Montreal. Was, we saw some behavior that I just went, what are you doing? You stop, stop it. Not you personally. I said, we, there are some people out there. Mm. And it drives me nuts. We identify, and I don't mean us, we, but the larger we, with our pain and our trauma. And that becomes indicative of who we are and our narrative mm. that we tell ourselves and that we tell everybody else. So all these people who are activists and have been fighting for so long, they identify with this trauma that they've been through and they are operating from that space into the world. And so it's guards up, guns out, territory, and it doesn't, we have well, to- Well, it doesn't help anybody. Out. And I see that not just in people living with HIV, I see no, it in LGBTQ of I agree with you. about racism. It's in every aspect of society. Everybody has their root, long extended pain, and they're carrying that with them, and it's informing the way that they go out to the world. And, I, and we're all 
butting heads because we all have our own pain and yeah, we all are yeah, justified yeah. in that pain and our ego says, I am victimized and right. I need to be and I need to be compensated and I need to be addressed. Yes. And I need to be recognized validated yeah. in that. And that's so it's not helpful. It's not helpful. But I and I think it's yeah. Well, the less I say on this, the better, because I'll end up getting myself in trouble. We'll keep it on the deal. We'll keep it on the deal. <laughs> Careful. <laughs> this has been nice. It has been nice. nice. We should do it again. Day. We should do it kind of like periodically. Every couple of years on a new couch. Yeah, just, just, let's see what our bodies look like in a few <laughs> oh, years. <fuck. laughs> I can't wait for the side by side, because I was, well, I was 30 pounds lighter when we did the last one. I know that much. <laughs> Likewise. Yeah. By then, AI will have taken over and we'll just... Uh, look, we'll have a I want legs. Body. I'm glad I championed for legs for you people. Because didn't I say something about that AI stuff you did? I'm like, why don't legs. people have legs? You, yeah. <laughs> oh, that's, that's the metaverse. <laughs> yeah, the, sorry, but whatever. I was like, you need legs. It looks very odd yeah. that you're just torsos. Well, what's his name? Facebook? Oh, meta. meta of Zuckerberg. Zuckerberg. Get on it. Get, give us some legs, goddammit. Goddammit. Um, yeah, more, yeah, there might be in the metaverse, for all, for all I know. Hopefully I'll look better. Ready Player One. Sure. <laughs> this has been nice. Thank yes. you for having me. Carl, thank you for joining me. Thank you everyone for watching. Um, hopefully we didn't offend too many people, but it's nice to have just an open... Slide into my on. DMs if I offended you. <laughs> Please. On the deal. On the, on the down low. Oh, I'm going to get in so much trouble for a second. <laughs> I love you all. Um, he loves around. you all. I, for the record, don't. I don't love you all. I don't know most of you. I like you. I, I'm going to start live streaming. So I think I'll, I'll post this as a live stream and then people can like sort of chat as they're watching. Okay. And I'll engage. But put your, put your questions, your comments in. This is what you do, isn't it? You do this. You, down there. YouTube. Yeah. YouTube, yeah. YouTube. And like and subscribe and by hitting the bell. And then we can follow up and I can follow up with Carl if you have any questions. Yes, please. Okay. I like a follow-up. Goodbye. Till next time.